the show and then download it on their website because mm -hmm. this is an actual visual which you don't always have this much time uh -huh. on. So um, you'll also be welcome to do that. Welcome to Behind the Pages. Alfie Cohen is with us today. He is back on the show and this time to talk about the myth of the spoiled child. Alfie is a nationally recognized expert on parenting and education. He has appeared on NPR numerous times, uh, as well as on CNN and uh, B the BBC. The myth of the spoiled child looks at this idea that has become very popular in the media today and, and actually has always been of that the children today are spoiled, entitled, and think too much of themselves. He looks at this and, explore, and, and exposes it for the myth that it really is. So welcome. I'm going to actually let you talk about your book now oh, thank uh, you. a bit. Um, and I wanted to start by asking you, um, you mentioned in your book that there are a lot of parents who are politically liberal, um, but when they talk about their children, I think you say they begin to sound like right-wing talk show hosts. <laughs> um, what, how did you decide that this was a problem that was pervasive enough that it was important to research it yourself and write a book about it? I guess I'm always interested when practices point in one direction and good logic and evidence points in another. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've explored a number of issues where I think that's true, having to do with education and parenting and human behavior more generally. Mm -hmm. With respect to parenting, though, I began to notice that it isn't just parents. It's people in general who are centrist or even politically progressive mm -hmm. um, who, as you correctly summarize it, sound like they're on Fox News when the conversation turns to kids, what they're like and how they should be raised. Mm -hmm. And I noticed not only that fact, anecdotally, but that virtually all articles that appear in the popular press in mm -hmm. magazines like The New Yorker and The New York Times Magazine and The Atlantic, blog sites, newspaper columns around the country, all sound so uniform in the positions that they've accepted uncritically that you could swear one person had written them all. Mm -hmm. uh, all recycling the same myths that children are spoiled, are entitled, are narcissistic, that parents on the one hand are too permissive and indulgent, and on the other hand, oddly somehow, are also overprotective, doing too much, they're helicopter parents, and that kids get stuff too easily. Mm -hmm. uh, stickers and A's, praise, trophies, even self-esteem, they haven't earned it. <laughs> and as a result, um, they're ill-prepared for, for real life. So I began to look at these views, not only at what empirical evidence, if any, supports them, and I was able to find virtually nothing, mm -hmm. but also what values underlie this kind of discourse, which I believe is deeply social, socially conservative, which makes it all the more puzzling that people who don't think of themselves as conservative mm -hmm. uh, seem to echo these same assumptions. Mm -hmm. So the, the get, get tough policies that are, you know, sort of promoted as, as what uh, education needs these days. Um, there are many teachers and educators that uh, are against that, but they're, they're the ones that are actually with the children day in and day out. But they're not really listened to very much. Why is that? Well, that's a topic I've addressed in some other books mm -hmm. and articles to deal specifically with education, though there's something interestingly parallel there, too, where mm -hmm. liberal newspapers take a hard line conservatively supporting a corporate approach to school reform mm -hmm. with its emphasis on bribes and threats to raise test scores, privatization, and so on. Mm -hmm. When you talk to actual teachers, you're able to find a lot more skepticism about that agenda because mm -hmm. they're closest to the kids and they see how much damage it does when you turn schools into an MCAS prep academy, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but teachers have been largely discredited. Uh, they are not listened to because they're a special interest and it's mm -hmm. become very popular to beat up on teachers' unions in particular, that being a more politically savvy way to attack teachers themselves mm -hmm. and exclude them from the debate. Mm -hmm. But in this book, I talk about um, parenting and the extent to which parents, in many cases, have accepted some of the same sorts of criticisms that are offered by people who aren't parents. Mm -hmm. 
where the idea is that um, it's important not to be too permissive. And so I think a number of parents really have internalized that fear mm -hmm. so that most parents are far too controlling of kids lest anyone uh, tag them as being mm -hmm. permissive. Mm -hmm. And what does this term permissive mean? And I think you talk about this a lot in the book. That, you know. Well, there was a time um, almost 100 years ago mm -hmm. where it had a more innocuous interpretation where it basically meant common sense listening to kids, recognizing that in the, and, and the revelatory title of one book that came out in the 30s, Babies Are People Too. Mm -hmm. And the assumption is that maybe we should listen to kids about when they're ready to eat, you know, mm -hmm. or um, uh, rather than requiring them to nurse or poop on our schedule. Mm -hmm. But gradually permissive has come to mean, I think, in the minds of the general public as well as those who write scholarly articles on the topic, uh, that we let kids do whatever the hell they want mm -hmm. without offering any uh, guidance or, or restriction of any kind. Mm -hmm. And it is a pejorative term exclusively. So is the word coddled, mm -hmm. which used to mean uh, just to handle with care. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now it means again to mm -hmm. overindulge in some sense, which is the fear mm -hmm. in a very conservative culture that we live in. We are much more likely, especially in public, to be criticized for not controlling kids sufficiently, letting them get out of hand, mm -hmm. rather than being criticized for being too controlling. Mm -hmm. And you, you really made a lot of attempt to see where the science is behind this, and mm -hmm. there really isn't any, is there? Well, uh, there are no good nationally representative surveys to mm -hmm. indicate what proportion of parents today really are permissive or punitive mm -hmm. or able to respond to kids without being punitive or permissive, a third mm -hmm. category that's often dropped out of the equation entirely. Mm -hmm. um, so if we have no data to support the anecdotal claims that parents are too permissive these days, we certainly don't have any basis for claiming that parents are more this way now than mm -hmm. they used to be. And in the first chapter of The Myth of the Spoiled yeah. Child, I go backward a decade or two at a time, mm -hmm. showing that people were making exactly the same claims about what kids today are like as opposed to the good old days. Mm -hmm. And during those good old days, people were saying exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. The other claims have to do with parents being um, overindulgent, uh, spoiling kids. Mm -hmm. And of course, you would have to prove that that was true and that kids are spoiled and that one causes the other. Mm -hmm. But articles and books that make these claims never even attempt to do anything careful to show that that's, that that's what's actually happened, that that's what's mm -hmm. out there. And then we find the interesting claim that parents aren't just too permissive, but that they are hovering too close to their kids mm -hmm. and not letting them fail enough for their yeah. own good. And once again, it's driven mostly just by stories and quotations by people who happen to agree with the author. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, that somebody will tell an extreme story and then say that this is pervasive, that everyone, you know, they're all the children or this is happening to too many of the children and give one extreme example that probably nobody would really argue with. However, as you say, this is not necessarily representative right. of parents. We, we tend to, to notice and remember mm -hmm. the events, the incidents mm -hmm. that corroborate what we already believed. Mm -hmm. I mean, years ago, I I debunked the notion that people are crazy during the full moon, which a lot of people still believe. Uh -huh. That's because right. they already believed it, and yes. if they see an instance that confirms it, that's the yes. one they focus on. They ignore people mm -hmm. acting crazy during the first quarter of the moon, you know, or people mm -hmm. acting normally next month during the full moon. Right. So I think we do that with kids too. Mm -hmm. But that raises the question of why we're so eager to believe um, that kids are like this. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a strong distrust of children Mm -hmm. that runs throughout our culture, a sense that they have to be taken down a peg, mm -hmm. um, that they're too big for their britches. And you find the most uh, extraordinarily disparaging comments about millennials now mm -hmm. in the popular press without any support whatsoever. Interestingly, many of those claims are made by people who were themselves disparaged as slackers if they were born in the 80s or yes. as 
you know, shiftless hippies if they were born in the 50s, or, mm -hmm. you know, and we just never seemed to tire of doing that. You know, there was a guy out in Wellesley, an English teacher, who gave a commencement address a couple of years ago called You're Not Special, which was met by this enormous amen chorus. He got a book deal out of that speech. You know, it was reprinted in the Boston Herald, um, mm -hmm. uh, a million hits on YouTube. As a culture, we want to hear uh, children put down and told, you get stuff too easily. And I'm trying to debunk these mm -hmm. claims and figure out what attitudes and beliefs about children and about human nature underlie this readiness to accept the worst about mm -hmm. young people. Would you say that it's more common amongst people who no longer have young children to have those kind of attitudes? I don't have a good answer to that. Uh -huh. I can only give you an impression. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't have any, any support. Uh, I suspect it's probably true, but I find that even people who have young children and mm -hmm. love them nevertheless aren't all that fond of other people's children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they may think my, my adorable daughter or son is the exception to the rule mm -hmm. of kids who are generally a, a pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, as a culture, we're really beholden to this ideology mm -hmm. that is uh, deeply challenging of these things and especially makes us think that kids need to work harder. Mm -hmm. You know, that they, they cut corners, we don't value excellence the way we used to, you know, they get trophies now just for participating. Mm -hmm. They get A's too easily. There's the, this almost paranoid fear of grade inflation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that we praise kids for stuff that isn't really that impressive and that they think too well of themselves. Mm -hmm. I have a whole chapter on the, the conservative attack on self-esteem. Mm -hmm. For me, this is all really of a piece. And so what I do is first see what beliefs here could be confirmed or disconfirmed by research? Mm -hmm. Like saying, if kids get participation trophies or if they get more A's than we think they ought to get, then they will feel entitled and not be prepared for the real world when they mm -hmm. get out in it. Something you hear quite often. Right. That you could prove or disprove, and there's no evidence to support it. Mm -hmm. So then I sort of peel back a layer and say, what moral certitudes are really driving these beliefs, mm -hmm. given that when you show the evidence or absence of evidence um, with respect to these beliefs, uh, for example, it turns out that it's not a particularly effective way to prepare kids for future unhappiness by deliberately making them unhappy while they're small, <laughs> right? Um, and you show this to people, mm -hmm. they don't miss a, a beat. They just mm -hmm. pivot and talk about morally. They lost. They're not supposed to get trophies, <laughs> regardless of what the actual yes. effects are. And right. you say, aha, yeah. now we're looking in the belly of the beast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there have been surveys done um, amongst uh, you know, that, that to support or maybe they don't actually support, but the in support of the children think too well of themselves. But those surveys have not really been done in a very scientific way, have they? No. There, there, there's never been any good research mm -hmm. up until very recently about any of these claims about kids being spoiled or feeling entitled, any of that stuff. But there's, there's kind of a, a one-woman operation by a, psych a conservative psychologist named Jean Twenge. Mm -hmm. Whenever you see an article in the New York Times or the Boston Globe or Wall Street Journal mm -hmm. purporting to show new data that kids think too well of themselves yeah. or are more, more narcissistic than they used to be, it's always from Twenge. Mm -hmm. But when a couple of other social scientists and data analysts reviewed her data mm -hmm. carefully or tried to replicate it with new data sets, they came up empty-handed, were unable to support it. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and I show why in the book. Mm -hmm. So without Twenge's claims, there's nothing there at all. Mm -hmm. It may be that young adults think more highly of themselves um, or score higher on questionnaires designed to tap narcissism mm -hmm. than older adults. But that's a that's not a change of cohort over time. No. That's a developmental difference that's always been true. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, and uh, do, you, um, do you think part of it, I mean, when, when there's sort of a perception publicly, it becomes the truth. And do you think that that has 
influence the p parents of young children today, too, that they're afraid to say, you know, sometimes my child just needs to veg out a little here. Sometimes, you know, yes, I understand my child's kind of having a bit of a meltdown, but it's been a tough week. I mean, it seems like they feel, if anything, we've made parents more, these kind of articles have made parents more defensive. Yes. And, it's Absolutely. harder for them to talk about. It is. Um, and as I said a moment ago, I think mm -hmm. that most parents are so fearful of being accused of being permissive that they mm -hmm. overcompensate by being over-controlling. Um, everybody thinks that kids in general mm -hmm. are given too much freedom and are spoiled. The surveys keep showing this decade after decade, mm -hmm. each time saying it's worse now than it's ever been. Yes. Um, <laughs> We're at a crisis point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but also thinking that other parents don't crack down enough with their kids. Mm -hmm. um, now, that may reflect a carefully considered viewpoint of the correct way to discipline, mm -hmm. or it may just be that we think other kids are a pain in the butt mm -hmm. and should be silenced so they're not, they're not a nuisance to me. Mm -hmm. And I think it's clearly true, and we've, we've had some, some research on this for a while, some of it out of the University of Toronto and elsewhere, showing that uh, parents are much more controlling of their kids when they're in public. Mm -hmm. presumably because they fear the judgment of strangers, mm -hmm. even people they don't know, um, or the internalized stranger they carry around with them. Yeah. Never mind what we hear on syndicated radio shows um, or from our mothers-in-law you know, mm -hmm. or whoever, which is this pressure to be more traditional. Mm -hmm. And that kid has you wrapped around her finger, yeah. you know, and that uh, children are so manipulative, you have to show them very clearly who's boss. You know, when they get into the real world, nobody's going to think they're special and make a fuss over them. Mm -hmm. but this is truly disturbing stuff, but we tend to channel it in a way where we don't even think about the implications of this. Mm -hmm. And the alternative to over-parenting when it does exist is not to parent less Mm -hmm. and let kids suffer more without coming to their aid. It's to parent better, mm -hmm. which means being responsive to their needs right. rather than being focused on what people will think of us mm -hmm. or being focused just on putting out the fires and getting compliance. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a parent of two children. I know the strong push to just get your kid into or out of the bath yes. or the car or right. the bed. Mm -hmm. You know, but the reality is that when parents are asked, as I ask them in lectures that I give around mm -hmm. the country, what are your long-term goals for your children? Almost everybody says stuff like, I want my kid to be happy, mm -hmm. to be ethical, to be compassionate and caring, mm -hmm. to be an independent thinker um, who's responsible, a lifelong learner. People mm -hmm. use terms like this all along. And thus, what I try to invite people to do is to recognize that traditional short-term practices like mm -hmm. rewards, including verbal rewards, good job, yeah. and punishments, including timeout, which mm -hmm. properly should be called forcible isolation of young children when they need us most, mm -hmm. are likely to undermine the very long-term objectives that most parents themselves have for their kids. Mm -hmm. So supporting kids, giving them the support they need, and helping them to have some say over their own lives mm -hmm. turns out to be much more useful for kids. And I think as parents, we feel constrained to do what's best for kids because of this constant drumbeat of conservative mm -hmm. ideology that we need to set more limits, mm -hmm. um, offer tougher consequences, and push kids to be self-sufficient as early as possible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when people, when you, I think when you invite people to talk about their memories, good and bad, of their, their own childhood, mm -hmm. um, a lot of times when people give examples of the good things that they got from their parents, it's when their parents actually stood up for them at a time they mm -hmm. needed it. Mm -hmm. I was just recently in a conversation with someone who was talking about how, um, she was treated very unfairly in school by a teacher, and her mother marched down to the school and said, you know, do not, you know, and set some limits with that teacher. And to this day, she remembers her mother doing that for her. And I mean, I think that this is, when we think about ourselves, 
if, if people could be invited to think about what, what motivates me to want to be a better, you know, to do better at something, mm -hmm. it's not somebody telling me you're not capable. I mean, that no. I find very defeating. Um, and it's not failure. It's, no. This has become the buzzword in the last few years is kids mm -hmm. need to fail more and they yeah. also need more grit. That's mm -hmm. become the latest social science craze. Yeah. Self-discipline, self-regulation, persistence. Mm -hmm. um, and that if kids are frustrated more, they will uh, overcome mm -hmm. failure in the future. That can happen, but it's not the rule. No. What social science teaches us is that what conduces to future success is past success. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. when kids fail, especially in a public way, or worst of all, in the context of a competition mm -hmm. where you're losing to someone else, that tends to lead kids in general, not always, but usually, mm -hmm. to form an image of themselves as not competent and likely to fail from now on. Mm -hmm. So the notion that it's good for kids to skin their own knees, for mm -hmm. us to step back and let them do stuff they're not gonna succeed at, that that will make them pick themselves up and brush themselves off and say, gosh darn it, I'm gonna <laughs> try even harder next time is more of a utopian fantasy yeah. than any liberal or leftist notion mm -hmm. that conservatives love to attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like I said, when most people think of themselves, would that really motivate you personally? Um, usually the answer is no. You know, I mean, we can right. all think of times in our lives when we've worked and somebody has said that wasn't good enough. Right. That makes you kind of say, well, then that's it. I can't do it, you know. And certainly when it, children who are powerless and not necessarily very good at expressing themselves, um, it's even harder because they're, they're in situations where they can't say, you know, this is not helping because I don't right. think that they're able to even conceptualize that. You know? the, what you say about their inability to conceptualize it mm -hmm. is particularly true, of course, of young children. Yeah. But many of these same arguments apply to older children. Mm -hmm. So in part of the book, I look carefully at claims about helicopter parenting of college age students mm -hmm. and, and young adults beyond college. And it's really interesting what you find when you actually look to see what's, only in the last few years do we have any evidence on this. Mm -hmm. All the articles decrying helicopter parenting as both pervasive and pernicious mm -hmm. are based on nothing. But now we have some research. Mm -hmm. First, it's not all that common. Okay, yeah. Second, it's often helpful. Mm -hmm. There was a major study that came out um, a few years ago that found that kids in college whose parents were very closely involved in their lives were faring much better than expected, including at intellectual engagement with what was going on in college, mm -hmm. as well as other stuff like being less likely to binge drink and so on. Mm -hmm. Third, where helicopter parenting isn't so good for kids, it's because the parent is needing to control the kid mm -hmm. because of the parent's own psychological needs, yeah. not because of excessive indulgence. Mm -hmm. And fourth, it's not one size fits all. Kids mm -hmm. vary in the amount of support they need, yes. in part, not just based on personality, but also based on gender, mm -hmm. ethnicity, race, class. So for example, Students who are the first in their families to go to college mm -hmm. typically need a lot more support of every kind mm -hmm. from their parents than they're getting. Yeah. And so the kind of sweeping notion that, you know, they're, they're adults now, damn it, we can't be fighting their fights for them, mm -hmm. and looking over their shoulders, they've got to make it on their own, represents a culturally limited and limiting notion of what maturity consists of which isn't always about independence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, they're, they're still, even young adults, I mean, I think that's part of what you, you're saying too, is um, young adults aren't, they're not grown up yet. You know, they, they, they still need support and we need to cut them a little slack too. Um, they're not where they're going to be in another decade. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't mean that they don't, that they're not gonna continue changing. I mean, people change throughout their lives depending on where they're at and, and what they're doing. And so, mm -hmm. um, so I, I, one of the, um, can you, uh, one of the things that you detailed in your book was the, and you started to refer to this a few minutes ago, uh, how this has been a, a claim over decades, probably centuries, even more. Um, it, 
it was, there are a number of books that have been published talking about how spoiled children are. Can you give us a few other examples? I think one was called um, Today's Children, Spoiled, uh, spoiled Rotten, um, and uh, that was published in the 90s. But then another book was um, Permissiveness, a Beautiful Idea That Didn't Work, and that was 1976. That was an article in U.S. News and World Report. Okay. Right. But there's a whole range of these that mm -hmm. happened that were, that were laid out, mm -hmm. um, starting with, uh, I love this book called the, the Epidemic, The Rot of American Culture, Absentee and Permissive Parenting, and the Resultant Plague of Joyless, Selfish Children. <laughs> If you've that read was... the subtitle, you've read the book. Okay, yes. Um, but then you find other books that go back as well as articles mm -hmm. in all the news weeklies. Time magazine and mm -hmm. does this uh, almost every few years regularly. Kids. Oh, yeah. In fact, I think you were talking about Time magazine that they recently published an article, Do Kids Have Too Much Power? Right. And, and another was... one, the, even yeah. more recently, just yeah. a few months ago, okay. called The Millennial, Millennials, The Me, Me, Me Generation, uh -huh. which was based entirely on the prejudices of the author. It was just was extraordinary. There, were, was anything, um, were, were there even polls taken to support that? Or um... No, but there was some research from mm -hmm. Twenge. Okay. You know, yep. the re media love her because yeah. she tends. She says what they want. She, to hear. she yeah. says exactly what yeah. they've been saying. Yeah. Uh, there was a book in the early '60s called "Suburbia's Coddled Kids," mm -hmm. another one in '63 called "The Child Worshippers," in the mid '50s, "Parents on the Run." So, what's really interesting mm -hmm. is that these predate the peace and love generation. Yes. of the 60s and 70s, so mm -hmm. you can't blame it on that. Right. So the fallback argument is it's all Dr. Spock's fault. Mm -hmm. Except there's two problems with that argument. One, Spock really wasn't permissive at mm -hmm. all. He was pretty conservative on most disciplinary issues. And two, this stuff was going on even before Spock. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, well, at least Spock did tell mothers they could feed their children when they were hungry. When the children were hungry, right. Yes. Yeah, yeah but his, and, remember, yeah. Spock's motto was trust yourself. It mm -hmm. wasn't trust your children. Well, that's true. That's true, yeah. Um, I just you know, have known children who were raised with um, having to be on a every four-hour feeding schedule when they were babies and hearing uh, my mother-in-law talk about how her son cried for three and a half hours until his next feeding came. So I do appreciate the fact that Spock brought out yes. the idea that it's okay to um, respond to your children's needs. When they're, That's right. No, I'm not, I'm not dismissing yep. that he made it an, an, an impact on important mm -hmm. aspects of being responsive to children. But he was hardly uh, an advocate for permissiveness in the way that conservatives uh, no, uh, assert. No, accuse him of. Yes, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Well, it has been a pleasure having you on the show. Unfortunately, we are out of time. You have been watching Behind the Pages from the staff of 22 City View. I'm Diane Goshkarian. Thank you for being here. And thank you. I wish I had another hour My with pleasure. you because I, as I was reading the book, I was having <laughs> mental conversations with you about <laughs> and thinking of examples. Um, to support both from raising my own children, my childhood, you know.